welcome everyone to this week's Cat's Eye on the Future. This week, we'd like to welcome back our regular guest, Kibilda for Gunderson, and he's going to continue the series we started at the beginning of the year on herbs and herbalism. And today he's going to talk about some specific herbs. So he's going to start out with plantain and angelica and see how we go from there. So over to you, Cavell Doffer. Okay. Um, as some of you re will recall, um, last interview I did here, um, I just gave sort of a, a general, very kind of vague overview of Germanic herbalism and herbal practice. Um, today I'm going to talk about some of my favorite herbs, um, these will be extremely well known to any herbalists out there. Um, hi, Rob, are you listening? Um, but, um, they may not, may not be as familiar, um, to just the average Alcetru person li living in Vinland. Um, so, um, I shall go ahead and introduce them. Um, and the herb I'm going to start with is plantain. Um, now, plantain is a very common plant over here. It also grows pretty widely in North America. Um, I, I've seen it up on the East Coast and um, talk, talked with herbalists there who, who have been making use of it um, possibly since, since um, Europeans first came over. Um, it's a, a small plant, um, looks like a weed. Um, it has rosettes of... Um, either ver very spiky spear-like leaves in one variety, um, or sort of round leaves, roundish, um, leaves on stalks. It's very difficult to describe plants accurately. So if you're going to look for it, um, in your own yard, go get a book. Um, they'll have pictures. It's much better than trying to find a plant from a description, which is not a good idea. No, this is not the same plantain that looks like a banana. No, this is... Um, for some reason, um, the word plantain also got attached to those little, little green bananas you get. Where is it? Africa? Uh, Africa and South America. There, You find them in North America, largely in Latin American grocery stores. And I was very confused because I used to think they were the same thing, and I couldn't figure out what these bananas would do. Okay. Um, yeah, but it's there, despite it being the same confusing word, there are two, two totally different types of plants. I have no idea what the um, Linnaean name for the banana is, um, but the herb is Plantago major um, for the the wider leaf version, and Plantago lanceolata um, for the pointy leaf version. Um, medicinally, it doesn't make much of a difference between the broad leaves and the pointy leaves, except that that the lanceolata um, actually may may be stronger in regards to the. Um, natural antibiotic compounds, which I'll get to in a bit. Um, now, plantain um, was a herb of very considerable importance to our forebears, or at least some of them. Um, it appears most notably um, in the Nine Herbs Charm, where it's called Waybread, probably suggestive of the fact that plantain tends to grow in kind of grassy waste areas such as the trampled sides of roads, roads or fields or anywhere really where you've got um, grass growing and occasionally being trodden on. Um, and in the Nine Herbs Charm, um, it describes the plantain as being effective against the loathly foe roaming over the land. Uh, now, this is probably um, almost probably a, met, a word... A description of disease-causing whites of some sort, um, you know, whether whether it happens to be um, save, save workers or malignant alfs um, or any any of a number of of the various mix, mixed horde of things that might be out there and might not be so kindly disposed to humanity, um, they often manifest as diseases and are seen as flying through the air, um, and. Um, of course, um, we plantain, as we have found recently, um, is very effective against whites of disease, um, specifically the um, ones that in the middle garth show up on a gram-positive stain under the microscope, um, Staphylococcus, Streptococcus, um, Clostridium, which includes um, the bacteria responsible for um, both tetanus and gangrene, um, unfortunately, um, plantain cannot be used to, to treat an, ad, um, an advanced case of tetanus or gangrene because, um, it 
will kill the bacteria, but it doesn't do a thing against the toxins. However, it was probably a very good preventative um, against gangrene um, getting started, because Clostridium is spores infecting the wound, and if you have the plantain treatment right away before they can spread and spread their toxins and do all the very unpleasant things that this particular Clostridium does. So well, was it spread on bandages? Or? Uh, Clostridium. Um, usually it's spores from the earth getting into a wound. No, excuse me, I meant the plantain. You, uh, it, the plantain um, is probably best applied, um, crushed into a poultice um, and spread on the wound. Um, now, we, you, you would, if you had gathered it from the wild, or indeed from your garden, um, you would want to give it a good wa wash um, to disinfect it before you did this, because obviously you don't want to be carrying any infections in. And if the wound starts looking manky anyway, just go straight to the doctor and get some antibiotics, okay? Yeah, but I was thinking more in traditional times. Yeah, in traditional times, it would... Usually the le leaves would have been crushed and put on the wound, or else it would have been made into an ointment which could be spread on the wound. Okay, so that that is um, the direct, direct medical use of plantain, of, of which the Anglo-Saxons were obviously well aware whether they characterized the wh whites responsible um, by their manifestations in the other world, or um, if whether they had had the opportunities we do to actually see the little buggers on a gram stain. Yeah, so nonetheless, it, it was also used, um, and again, this is where the magical protection against whites of disease versus the actual physical effects against whites of disease show up. It's one of the three herbs that makes up the ointment used in the charm with Ferstitia, um, against a sudden pain, which is one of the best known spells we've got against that collection of ailments which are variously known as Alf Shot, Witch Shot, Troll Shot, you know, whatever you want to call it. It suggests, again, that, um, something, something out in the other world has taken a, a dislike to you and is making it known by shooting at you, causing sharp, miserable pains. Um, which are almost certainly, any way you slice it, associated with, with um, or resulting in inflammation. Um, and I expect quite often in the day we're involved in infection as well. Um, and again, the culprits in this particular spell are, are described as riding out over the land. Um, we also have a, a recipe from the, the Leechdom Collection, using the roots of what they call smooth plantain, which is probably plantigo major, um, to cure someone who is, um, quote, alfsut, um, a word which we're still, some people are still debating whether this means hiccups caused by elves, um, or literally sucked on by elves, that is to say anemic, um, and so we, we can pretty safely say that the Anglo-Saxons saw planting as a good general warder against, um, any, uh, um, Ill, Ill willing and unpleasant whites that might be, you know, cruising around through the air even now. Um, and as mentioned, this was probably based on experience, um, because being effective against, um, staff and strep, it would have been Great, absolutely awesome for mo most um, superficial skin infections. Um, it is safe to take internally. Um, it, it could have been effective against um, strep throat and um, uh, other um, types of throat, throat infections. Um, I men mentioned the clostridia and, and the you know possibility to prevent gangrene if not to do any good once it gets settled in. Um, but in... In Norway, as we were we were um, briefly discussing earlier, the the leaves would be laid on a wound, and and this continued up into the late nineteenth, early twentieth century. In fact, um, they could be crushed, they could be cut to release the juices, um, they could have the le leaf's veins put, and and this kept kept the wound clean, helped it heal quickly and without infections. Um, and may also have hel helped to reduce bleeding. 
Um, now, Reifborn Kinnerud, um, who actually was himself a, a medical doctor in, in civilian life, but who was also one of our, possibly our greatest Norwegian folklorist either, particularly when it came to folk cures and uh, folk herbalism and the like, um, mentions this and compares it to the scene in Volsunga, um, where Sigmunder and Sinfietli are in their wolf skin, Sigmunder's just lost it and, and bitten Sinfietli's throat mostly out, and a raven comes along with a fresh leaf to put upon this near fatal wound, um, which, which then proper, properly heals up, and Sigmunder and Sinfietli um, go, go on to get, get the, get their revenge and cause more havoc here, here and there and, you know, be Volsungs. Um, Reichborn Kinnerud also notes that plantain was traditionally one of, one of the herbs, um, with which wounded snakes in the wild were believed to heal themselves. Now, okay, snakes are not really best known for their awesome intellects, and I, I'll believe that one when I see it, but that's, um, how, that's how we saw it in Norway back in the day. Um, yeah, we also have an interesting, um, just a hint in the Nine Herbs charm, um, that Plantain was considered exceptionally mighty. Um, it's actually given the title Mother of Herbs, um, which, which suggests a special place for it. Um, and considering that they did not have um, the the brief example of mother of battles and other such phrases of of many hundreds of years <laughs> later um, well um but in in the pharaohs it was the old custom to carry plantain with you to ward off witchcraft in general um and the pharaohese version of the um getting getting rid of your um mate's holdra um elvish, otherworldly lover, um, involved tying a plantain to yourself. Now, the, the Swedish and, and Norwegian um, versions of this particular one, where some sort of plant or plant combination um, will make the otherworldly seducer go away, have very complex recipes um, with uh, spot, spotted orchid, da Daphne, the um, a herb called vivang, which seems to apply to a couple of different herbs, garlic, grass from, from the roof, whatever. Um, but they didn't have a lot of plant variety in the pharaohs, um, so they relied on plantain um, for this purpose. But again, that dovetails very neatly with the keeping unwanted supernatural invasion away from your body. So, so why would one want to get rid of a supernatural lover? Because um, they're screwing your husband. Usually it's your husband. Okay, so it's not screwing it, you. Yeah, it, it's the wife um, who who wants to um, get rid of the husband's lover. Um, occasionally that. a woman who's being harassed by an elvish guy who won't take no for an answer. Um, okay, got it. Yeah. Uh, th this appears to have been a real problem in Sweden. I mean, there there's all these stories of... You know, guys who are off with the the Holdra girl in the woods, guys who are are shagging Skos Rowett in in the woods, um, serious child custody issues after the guy dies, and and the supernatural woman shows up complaining about the seven kids he left her with with no provisions. You know, obviously it was a real social issue. Um, Interesting. Yeah, interesting. I don't know. I, I guess if you had a problem, you could complain to Freyr him being king of Alfheimer, but, you know, whether whether you get a response, I, I would not would not be swift to comment. Um, but in, anyway, um, which brings us kind of in a roundabout way back to the plantain um, via Freyr um, and, and the Alfar, because one of the most interesting things to me about the verses for Plantain and the Nine Herb Charms um, are how very vanic a lot of the imagery that they seem to have associated with the plantain was. Um, it's a you plantain, mother of herbs, open from the east, mighty within. Over you carts have run, over you queens have ridden, over you brides have cried out, over you bulls have snorted. Um, now, the second line is rather reminiscent of the Anglo-Saxon rune poem line. Um, Ing was first, or Frere, um, if you like, was first seen among the East Danes by men, 
Later back again over the waves he traveled, his his wagon sped afterwards. Um, the third line with the carts um, running in the queen, Queen's Riding also sounds, if, if you like, and I do, um, rather reminiscent of, of the Vanek processions, which seemed to have been very thoroughly established from the time of Tacitus with Nerthus, um, all the way up through the end of the Viking Age, with um, Frere's wagon and priestess going around um, in Gunnar's Stouter Helmings. Um, and Ings Wayne in the rune poem may also be re referring to these Vanek processions. Um, and then the fourth line, in which we have marriage and cattle, both shown in a very sexual manner, which um, indeed could have, you know, almost been lifted from Sumer as a kuminen. Um, it's difficult not to read that in a Vanek light, at least if one is going to um, make the assumption that the cultural associations of the Vanek cult, as we know it from the chiefly from the Norse materials, um, were both originally present among the Anglo-Saxons and still known or remembered, at least in, in folklore, um, to the date of the Charms composition, which, like most of these, it's almost impossible to track down, except that you get that weird mending, blending of um, natural heathen, um, Christian, and possibly some southern her herb lore in that charm. It's it's one of those mixed ones that's a little problematic. Um, but anyway, I, I think there's some, plenty of room there for modern practitioners um, if they're looking for um, a Vanek herb, particularly a herb of warding, warding. You know, plantain strikes me as a pretty good bet for it. I'm not going to say that the, the Vikings, for instance, used plantain in Vanek rituals. We can't say that. We don't know. Um, but, um, it at least, at least seems a a appropriate in modern times, if nothing else. But, so if you, like, wanted to make for modern use sort of a chart of different herbs associated with different, uh, either groups of deities or deities, planting would possibly be Vanek. Yeah, plantain would definitely be Vanek if you were going to do that. Now, there are, there are a few herbs that have more, more direct associations with different deities, um... <laughs> Fairly scarcely, and then there is the issue of herbs where Mary probably got substituted for Frigg or Freya. Um, but in in terms of general associations, I I think that's about where it lies. That that was going to be my other question. Actually, was if any of them later come become associated with saints that seem to harken back to and yeah, and and you get deity. that. I mean, you you look at um, Hypericum perforatum, which um, I call Suna's wart, which Christians call St. John's wart, um, and it's very, very, very it's, um, strongly associated with Midsummer folk traditions um, south of Denmark. Uh, north of Denmark, Arnica, which also has gold flowers and blooms about the same time, um, seems to gradually take over for it. Um, but from D Denmark down through, through Germany um, and in England, um, you have this herb, which is named after um, a Christian saint, um, associated with the Christian Saints' Day, um, but, you know, it, it's basically a heathen holiday. It's Midsummer's, um, and um, it, one, one would be extremely remiss um, in suggesting that the, the veneration and the, the associations of that herb um, were Christian things. So... Back to the, the folk uses of plantain. Um, again, in Norwegian tradition, um, it was also the custom on Midsummer's Eve to take several flower heads of um, the ribwort plantain, the lanceolata with the spiky leaves, preferably an uneven number, and pluck the flowers away, then put them under a stone with a wish for each. Um, if any showed fresh flowers the next morning, the wish would be fulfilled. A similar Midsummer's divination was practiced to find if two people should wed. Um, two stalks were picked on Midsummer's Eve and laid under a stone, and if they had bloomed afresh by dawn, the couple should be married. Or you could lay the stalks in a cross shape in your window for the same purpose, or you could put them under the pillow so you could so as to dream of your future mate. Um <clears throat> Or you could pick three bundles um, of the ribwort plantain heads, put them under the pillow with a wish for each, and those that blossomed again would be fulfilled. And this practice was common enough 
um, the, the plant was often called Yonsok's grass, um, Midsummer's grass, Midsummer plant, and the custom was known from the Orkneys, Shetlands, and Pharaohs uh, at least since 1468. Um, Marwick, who did the, a more recent collection of Orcadian and Shetland folklore, um, also records this practice in, in Shetland in the early 20th century, I believe. And you could use the greater plantain, the plantigo major with the wide leaves, to foretell the harvest by plucking the flowers off a stalk and setting the stalk in water, and if it bloomed again, the harvest would be good. And now again, none, none of these things say absolutely clearly that um, our forebears viewed this as a specifically bad herb, um, but they do fall into the general pattern of things that you generally think of going with the bonnier. Seems to be a lot of love magic going on there. Yeah, lo love magic, har harvest magic. Now it's um, some I interesting um, things with, with some of the folk names in contrast to this. Um, for the ribwort plantain with its spear-shaped leaves, um, the folk names include um, the Danish Kemper, a uh, warrior, um, as well as Norwegian, Swedish, and, and German equivalents, um, as well as Kriegsmen, a uh, warman, um, or Stridesman, again, ba battle man, both recorded in Jutland. Um, now, this may be because it was so good as a wound herb. And again, if you have a herb that's going to reduce the chances of getting gangrene from a battle wound, um, and keep, not to mention, strep, staff, and all, all the other appalling things which can and almost certainly will be crawling into a, a wound under those circumstances, um, that's a, a pretty good as association to have with that particular herb. Um, you know, and when you add that, the leaves are um, sword-shaped or, or spear-shaped, depending on how you want to look at it, um, and that it's um, excellent for battling the other worldly whites um, that are the um, ultimate or spiritual, if you like, cause of sickness. Um, well, there you go. Now, interesting, the Anglo-Saxon name Waybread for the, the Plantigo Major um, also survives in both Danish and German as a folk name, and in Germany, according to Grimm, wearing um, plantain leaves under one's feet on a journey would also help keep you from getting tired. Um, it's Now, the, the plantain is incredibly common in Northern Europe. In fact, it's normally perceived as a weed around here. Um, I don't think I know anyone who actually has to bother to cultivate it in their garden because, you know, it grows just on its own fine in large and copious clumps. You just have to find a nice area that's, you know, not constantly being shrouded in automobile exhaust um, or something like that. Um, for those of you in North America, I'd suggest um, checking out um, books on the, the wild plants of, of your own state, wherever you are, to see if it grows wild there. Um, you could probably get seeds and cultivate it because it's extremely hardy. Um, but I think it's already done a pretty good job of spreading itself. I have a question. Is that way bred as W-A-Y or W-H-Y? Is it way like in walking along it, the way? It's or... way like walking along the way. Okay. So... Yeah, nothing nothing to do with the stuff you get out of cheese. It doesn't curdle anything. It does, it, as far as I know, it doesn't. Yeah, as far as I know, nettle was what the one yeah, place. Nettle, and you, you could probably get a, a pretty good curdling with sorrel because it's got that sharp acid. It's often used um, in traditional European cooking old traditional European cooking um, before um, first bear juice from uh, unripe grapes and then lemon juice became popular. Okay. You know, back in the day, sorrel was the only way to get that really ni nice bit of an acid bite. You have been listening to part one of Cat's Eye on the Future. We'll return to the show right after these short messages. Do you have questions? The cards have answers. If you would like a personal reading with Melody, just go to my website, MelodyPsychicReadings.com. That's Melody with an I, PsychicReadings.com, for information, or email me at MelodyReader at gmail.com. Readings are available using Skype, phone, 
email, or even in person if you are lucky to live in Ireland. Why not find out what special messages the cards have just for you and book a private reading today? We now return to part two of Cat's Eye on the Future. Okay, so that that is plantain, um, and um, that is probably the le least appreciated major herb of, of the Nordic um, ma magico medical pharmacopoeia. Um, I think is the best way I can describe it. Yeah, it sounds like it was pretty darn important. Yeah, and it's um, be because it's not because it's not mentioned. Um, directly much in the old norse literature in the eddas or sagas we we tended to have a, ignored it but that that's the case with the vast majority of our herbs um there's only a few like angelica and leek that really get much of a, a look in in the recorded norse literary materials um hence the need to turn to what we can um glean or or possibly distill um out of the anglo-saxon stuff um, and then the folkloric uses. I wonder if it's sort of like, you know, we don't say every time uh, someone has a headache, if you, if, you know, if you were to say that they were going to take a pill, you would probably just assume it was an aspirin. Yeah, well, that and also, um, I think some of it is also an effect of who was writing down what materials. Um, the Anglo-Saxon stuff was written down by um, monks who were, um, concerned with with medicine, um, who you know were in a position of either being pretty sure that that the charms, even the ones that held definite heathen elements, were going to um, have a positive effect on what they were brewing, so they had to put them in, you know, or didn't want to leave them out just you know in case it might be important. Um, but the um, at this time in England, the monks were probably um, the certainly the primary of, official um, medical practitioners um, through most of the country most of the time. Um, now in Scandinavia, um, the healing with herbs, the responsibility for the Angelica Garth or Leek Garth for the family's herbs and a few choice vegetables were grown. Um, all all of that was in the women's hands. Um, so a a male chronicler, you know, might might know that. You know, for instance, Grima had um, put herbs and, and stones and whatever um, in her cauldron, but he might not know um, what she'd what she'd be likely to be putting in there. Um, not and then you add the Norse tough thing, where you know you you don't complain about you know my, minor things like having your foot chopped off um, or or an arrow in the roots of your heart. Uh, no, you just pull it out and remark how good the living is because there's a bit a bit of fat in the pericardium. Um, so you're you're probably not going to find a lot of um, basic first aid uses um, for herbs in in these stories. They wouldn't be as mentioned because they wouldn't be the responsibility of the they chronicler. Wouldn't, wouldn't be the responsibility of the chronicler. Would seldom be relevant to the plot. Um, you know, you get a, occasional things. Um, you know, the preservation with, with linen and leeks, um, there's one, one saga in which a guy's got a belly wound in battle and the old, old gal who's looking after him, um, she feeds him some onion soup and then sniffs at the wounds to see if his intestines are perforated, because if she smells onion, that means, whoops, they're perforated, he's probably dead. Yeah. Um, you know, but it, you know, again, re relevant to the story. Uh, most of the time, it just wouldn't have been. Um, but so a, f a few plants did get more more than a brief look in, um, which bring brings us on um, to one of the very favorite plants of the northern people from from then to now, um, which the uh, Christians and Latin speakers and late other people uh, refer to as and as it refer to as Angelica. Um, Angelica, Archangelica, um, I think there's uh, some Christian myth about the Archangel Michael and the plague or something like that. Um, I don't particularly like that name for the plant, 
Um, they're not my angels. Um, so I prefer to refer to it by the proper um, Germanic name, which is Fon, if you're speaking in a uh, northern um, Germanic language, or Juan, Juana, if you're speaking a West Germanic language. Um, but at, the, at this point, when I say Quan, you, you know what I'm talking about. Um, and to get, together with the leek, it was one of, one of our major um, plants, both spiritually and socially. Um, its vigorous growth and sweet scent led it to be um, understood as a herb of great might and luck. Um, it's native to all the Scandinavian countries um, except Denmark, and I'm including Iceland, Greenland, and the Faroes here. It grows very well there. Um, it grows eastward through Finland to Russia. Um, now, interestingly enough, um, and this is, is a, a rare exception in our herd lore, this one was totally unknown to the Greeks and Romans. Um, both the plant and the knowledge of its use appear to have come quite late to continental Europe, and most likely from monks in Scandinavia, um, after which Norway actually became um, a noted source um, of exported quan. Um, now, um, from the Viking Age onward, it was both cultivated and gathered wild, and again, this seems to have been really both deep-rooted and socially very important. Um, it, Faso observes that the tradition of communal trips into the mountain to gather Angelica, as described from Norway, was also known in the Faroes until early in the 20th century. Until the end of the 19th century, no household was deemed complete without a decent Angelica garden, but even so, they also gathered Angelica in, in the wild from nearby fields. Um, and this twofold being of the Kvan, which grows both within the garth and without, and bringing wheel from both within and without, may also offer um, to the the modern spiritual um, heathen um, a hint towards the understanding of its might. And I, I personally um, would put this these aspects together um, to say that they would fit very well with the goddesses of Etan kind, such as Skadi and Gerther, um, and the close Etan ancestry shared by most, if not all, of the gods. We don't know everyone's pedigree, um, so we can't say for everyone, but the gods of known pedigree, okay. Um, the friendship given to the gods by some Etan, such as Mimir and Grether, and the well-working Etan or troll figures, such as Barther Snaefe at Klaus, um, who are friends to humanity. Um, so there se seems to be a a huge amount of, of might in the Germanic mind um, stemming from crossing the borders of the Garth um, and the careful mingling of what is within to what is without. Um, and that is a, a very constant theme all the way through surviving Germanic literature and folklore of every sort. And so the Angelica, which is both, both the wild and the tame, um, is, is a very good image um, for that. I have a question, yeah. though. In modern times, has anybody done a chemical analysis? Is there any difference between wild and garden-grown angelica? Not to not to my knowledge. Okay. You know, I, I would guess that the wild-grown might, might be a, a bit raunchier um, in flavor as things that have been left wild-grown tend to be. Um, but... There, do, there does not seem, as far as anyone knows... Um, so there wouldn't be any actual chemical reasons for no. combining the two? Okay. No, it, do, it really... The social angelica gathering just really seems to have been a big, important deal. Okay. Um, now, um, as one of the few herbs that appears at all in the sagas, um, Kvana is actually found twice in Olaf Saga Trygvisunner, and both times it's being misused by the traitor king. Um, the first time, um, when Reuther in Rami refuses to forsake the troth of his kin, Olaf or Trygvason first tries to force a snake into Reuther's mouth, but he tur Reuther turns it away by blowing on it, which is possibly a magical act. Um, there's a lot of um, references to blowing in various um, minor ceremonies. Um, to, but to overcome this defense, Olaufer forces a Kwanstock into Reuther's mouth and drives the worm down it and into his throat with a hot iron to kill him. Um, now, this bizarre method of torture slash execution 
could well have been intended as either a practical or a quasi-magical act, it, but it could also be interpreted as a mockery of Reuther's troth in the gods. Um, there's some reason, quite a lot of reason, to think that the worm was associated um, with elements of heathenry, um, and the legal and social importance of the Angelica Garth, um, the family her herb special veg garden, as well as the considerable legal penalties in Iceland for someone who steals the Kwan plant, um, also suggest the possibility of a magico-religious importance for it comparable to that of the leek. Um, the second time Olaufer uh, misuses the Kwan, um, his wife theory has been deprived of her queenly inheritance of lands. Olaufer is reluctant to win them back for her, and that obviously causes a certain amount of marital friction. But one spring he sees a man in the market selling exceptionally large Angelica stocks, and he buys one and offers it one to his very unhappy wife, um, who quacks it out of his hand and says something to the effect of Harold or Gormson gave greater gifts, and he feared less to fare from his land and seek his own possessions that you do now, and that was tested when he fared here to Norway and laid waste the greater part of this land and took for himself all tributes and taxes, but you do not dare to fare through the Danish lands because of King's fame, my brother. Um... So he, he was told, right? Uh, but what, what really seems to ha have ticked theory off here is how false Olaufer's attempted gift to her is. Um, the fast-growing, unusually large Kwan should have stood as a vow that he would re-establish her inheritance, but she knows perfectly well he's not going to do that. So instead, she has to shame him into defending her rights, which starts the final happy chain of events that brings about his death. Um, now, an alternate reading for this, you know, there's always an alternate reading, or five or six or a hundred, um, with most things in the literature, but there you go. Um, it's also possible that Snorri, who was writing the saga, chose the Kwan, which was a great symbol of fruitfulness, certainly in later Scandinavian folklore, and very likely in the Viking Age as well, to emphasize that the marriage just wasn't working out on a personal base. Um, but in either case, the gift is certainly false. Um, now, Olaufer had already set the turning of his weird in the saga um, by courting Sigrither in Storrada with a gift that not only offered offense to the gods being stolen from the Hopit father, but also proved to be gold layered over copper, at which point the wise queen observed that he would be false to her in more things than that. Um, and by his ill use of the Kvan, whether he, the lie is about his love for theory or his care for her ancestral honor or both, um, he can be seen as bringing his doom to full fruit, and good riddance too. Um, the, um, but certainly the theme of the apparently pleasing but symbolically deceptive courting present rebounding badly on him um, with first Sigrither and, and then Theory is um, probably a deliberate repetition on, on Snorri's part. Um, and wh whether you want to argue... Um, that Snorri is here showing his at least antiquarian sympathy for his big bad heathen Viking ancestors. Um, I won't argue the point with you. Um, it also sounds like he was implying that Olaf might not have been quite as, shall we say, as large as he thought he was. Yeah, I, I think I think one could definitely take it, and I think that a Norwegian or Icelander hearing that story probably would think exactly that. Uh, now, st story could have been less subtle. It could have been a leak. Uh, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but at I any rate, so there, there's the romantic side. There's also a this very strong social side, which I was mentioning, and the Angelica shows up again um, in um, the social regard um, in the Flat Airboak manuscript of Fossbrother Saga. Now, we have our, our sworn brothers, Thormother and Thorgair, um, who occasionally have issues with each other and very, very dramatic. But in this case, they've gone into the mountains to get together, fawn together. Um, they find a ledge with a lot of big plants. Thormother carries the bundle up ahead, but Thorgair loses his footing and falls, um, saving himself by catching, um, hold of a large stalk. 
and um, Thormother calls down to ask why Thorgeir is taking so long, has he not found enough Angelica yet? And Thorgeir replies with that, you know, special tinge of Viking humor, um, I expect I shall have enough when this one I am holding is uprooted. Yeah. Um, and Thormother climbs down to rescue him, you know, and they go on and have a, a rather rocky relationship. Um, but eventually, you know, first the uh, Quan episode shows up the depth and truth of the bond between them. Um, and later Thormother takes a, a great vengeance for his, his sworn brother's death. Um, so despite issues, um, their oath, like, like the Quan plant, is true. Um, and we, we see the, the Quan yet again, probably, um, in Floamana Saga, where Thorgil's dreams, um, that, quote, I saw on my right knee that there were grown five, um, Hamloiker straw leeks, or in another manuscript, Hamloiker, helmet leeks, growing together, and from them blossomed many leeks, and high above my head bore one leak. So high it was and so fair that it, it had the color of gold, and his son Thorleifer interprets it as you shall have five children, from you shall descend many families, and uncounted folks shall spring from you, yet the fair leak that shall be a certain person who comes from you, and he shall be a more famous person than all, all of your other et folk. Um, now, the the word used is helm leak, but leak is a very common word in these kinnings, these riddle phrases, um, and Anthony Perkins um, wrote a very, very convincing argument evaluating um, the dream sequences in Floa Mana Saga, um, that here the helm loiker, or helm loiker if you like, is meant to be Angelica, um, and might perhaps be a word um, or kenning used for the wild to d distinguish it from the tame. Um, he also notes that um, if an alternative name for Angelica or a variety for it existed, it is clear why the author chose to use it here, specifically to make the pun on the two senses of Loiker, the mighty plant and the distinguished person. Um, and the helmet leak makes a lot of sense because... If one has ever seen Angelica plants in full bloom, um, they have these massive um, helm-like ball, balls of small flowers, and indeed they, they do raise very high indeed. Um, they have that clumping growth habit, um, and the, the exceptional height, um, the link with the future kindred are all very suggestive um, of the Kvan, um, and Perkins refers to a 12th century um, riddle, um, which is of particular interest in this regard, um, which describes a youth who ages before his mother's knee and in his father's foot shelter, um, his battle kidneys, which is a kinning for his testi testicles, um, if he grows willingly old, stand up above his forehead, his testicles he casts on all ways and gets of that children and sons. And the answer to the riddle is Angelica, uh, clumping same clumping growth habit, um, same family imagery as the Flow of Mana Saga dream, same overall fruitfulness, um, and there, there's a later Icelandic um, riddle of a similar nature. Um, a man dwells in the mountain, has many bairns. His testicles grow over his forehead. He is the worse if he lives long. And the testicles, again, are these huge flower balls which become seed balls. Um, and yes, indeed, the Quan does cast his seed all about him to get many children. In fact, if you have Quan blooming in your garden one year, the next year you're going to have a whole lot of it. I mean, really a whole lot of it. Everywhere. <laughs> Great stuff. Um, yeah. Now, um, there's not vast amounts of folklore, um, surviving, but but there's some, and it fits pretty well with the Old Norse materials as we have them. Um, in Norway, it was the tradition that a bride should sit upon her horse with a stalk of Angelica in her hand. Um, another Norwegian tradition holds that the bridegroom should do so as well, and his should be the larger. Um, this suggests that the wart is one of both fruitfulness and rule, uh, which indeed ma matches Olaf or Trygvason's false uses of the Kvan plant as a gift to his dispossessed queen. Uh, Kvan was also thought to be an aphrodisiac for cattle, 
and quite possibly for humans as well, which may be another reason old Olaf was bringing it back as a gift for his not-so-happy not so bride, because one gets the impression from her reception that, you know, there haven't been a whole lot of warmth in the marriage bed for him recently. Uh, so they, they were, the pond was traditionally harvested in Norway around midsummers on July 2nd, um, or on a Saturday night to be brought home on a Sunday. Um, the year-tide timing of the harvest could be practical, and I'll mention um, some of the issues with that later. Um, but again, we seem to have the, this focus on as associating it in some way with the might of the sun. Um, now, it, it's also um, interesting in that it seems to grow vigorously in the other world, um, there was a woman in late 11th, early 12th century Iceland uh, by the name of Hotlov Stroimfjörder, um, and she was a, a well-known um, woman of magic. Lots of, lots of interesting folklore about th this lady, um, but it said that she invited some of her friends and buddies around for a Yule banquet, as one does at that time of year, and she asked her guests to choose whatever food they'd like to see on the table, and she'd deliver it. Um, and they all went, ho, 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 yeah, let, it's the middle of winter, let's see you bring us some fresh Angelica shoots. Um, and Hala said, ah, grand so, and swam across the lake called Grunebotten, Green Lake, and dived into a deep pit at the bottom, coming back with a, a bag of fresh green veggies and fresh Angelica shoots, which she served to her guests, and, quote, people believe it to be true that Hotla fetched this Angelica um, from the underworld. Either that or she found a really good place to store her veg and keep them crisp all, all year at the <laughs> bottom of that lake. But, you know, the the, I, <laughs> the belief was that she'd fetched it from the underworld, um, which might re, um, remind us, and in fact did remind Jackie Simpson, um, of the fresh greens brought from the underworld at midwinter, um, by a woman of supernatural might in Saxo's story of Hadding. Um, so in both cases, in that case, it's Hemlock, which is a spooky plant of its own. But in both cases, we can see the might not only of the woman faring between the realms, um, but quite probably also the might of the plant she brings back from the other world. So do the Norse have a tradition of the underworld or the other world having opposite seasons from the middle, the middle garth? Not that we know of. However, we do seem to have have the tradition that there's always fresh green, and we get these phrases like the green world of the gods. Um, it's obviously, it's not necessarily a perpetual summer. Um, it always seems to be kind of deep winter around Thrymheimer, um, which is listed among the worlds of the gods um, as soon as Skadi, um officially joined the clan. Um, but you get the impression that there are at least some parts of the other world where it's perpetual spring or summer. It, it reminds me, actually, I was just reading a, uh, a, a write-up on a book of, by a doctor who was recording people's, uh, experiences of children who'd been brought back, who had died yeah. and been brought back. And one little boy said, heaven is full of gardens. And that just the way you said that the other world is full of greenery. Yeah, it just just twigged on me there that I, I wonder if that's kind of a, a, a not if not a universal human experience, at least not uncommon. I'd I'd say it's pretty close to being a universal. I mean, every everyone's version of the other worlds, you know, have like bad bad neighborhoods and good neighborhoods, you know. But whether you're a heathen thinking of the green worlds of the gods and fresh veg, veg at midwinter, which is a lot more appealing than it sounds if you haven't had fresh veg for, for at all for four months, um, or whether you're you're a Muslim dreaming of somewhere where you know water water runs freely and there's greenery and shade all all over the place, you know, or, or um, a Greek thinking of the, the lovely green playing fields of Elysium or whatever. Um, it's, it's pretty much, it's as consistent as a river. You know, I believe the Christian um, visions of the other world, if I'm not mistaken, also include gardens in the, the city of heaven. Am I correct there? I believe so. I'd have to look it up, but I, I'm thinking of the 12 gates, the city at the moment. From yeah, the song, but, I, but... I, I'm pretty sure that there are gardens involved somewhere. I, I would be amazed if they, they were not. 
Um, you know, you really don't get don't get a desert religion that doesn't dream of cool cool water and and cool green places. Whereas you probably don't get that many um, northern temperate religions that don't dream of warm green places. <laughs> uh, like Ireland, right now, where it's cold and dreary and wet and gray and dark, um, and the great green worlds of the gods sound pretty good. And we are doing this interview huddled in front of a space heater under blankets, yes. Yeah, but it, anyway, we're... Getting um, back to... Get, the, getting, getting back to... To Angelica and Erb. Um, ha- Hakla and Herkvon. Um, the other way in which, if you didn't have somebody who could go to the other world and fetch it, you know, nice and fresh for you in the middle of winter. The other way in which it could cheer you up and make your winter a better place to be is that it's always been very well loved as a brewing herb in the north. Um, ah. Traditionally in ale, um, later very popular in spirits, still is. Um, in fact, it's still one of the chief ingredient in many liqueurs and spirits, um, particularly gin, um, if you have a bottle of Bombay Sapphire, have a drink for me, please. Please, it's cold and wet here. Um, but if you have the bottle there, um, look at the sides where they have all the this plant, exotic plant from this place and the other, and you'll find Angelica from Saxony there. Um, and the the root is the part normally used for for this. Um, don't use it fresh. Um, the fresh root is really, really poisonous to hum- human beings. Um, it has to be thoroughly dried. Um, once it is thoroughly dried, it, it is pretty safe. Um, although the usual cautions regarding, um, med- medical interactions, um, particularly, um, if you are on any, any sort of, of blood thinning anticoagulant, talk to your doctor first. Um, et, et cetera. But, um, ha- having, having issued, issued that caution, um, it's one of our very, very, very favorite flavoring, um, materials for, um, in any sort of brewing. Um, probably give a ni- nice bit of a, a bitter, um, just tiny bit of resinous flavor to ale. Um, particularly if you're using it in the absence of hops, which our ancestors were for quite a while, and sometimes our, our cousins in Scandinavia still do. Um, the young stalks can also, and this is the way we see them more often in these islands, um, be candied. Um, you can get candied angelica in the shops here, and you can put it on cakes and things. Um, they can be stewed with rhubarb, or, um, although you never see this outside Scandinavia, they can be peeled and eaten raw, and the tender... Tinder uppermost bits are the nicest. Um, the leaves can be cooked with butter, um, although once they get um, older and tough, they get pretty bitter. Um, but it, if they're young, you can cook them with butter, and they're, you know, more or less edible. Um, and like, like most root herbs, if it's being used um, for either medical or flavoring purpose, um, the root strongest drawn in, in, dug in the autumn. Now, an, Angelica or Kwan is a biennial. Um, so if you're digging the, the roots in the autumn, you want to do it in the fir- first year. That's really the time to do it. Um, second year, it will sprout, it will bloom, um, and the whole plant, um, will be dead pretty early, long, long before autumn. Um, now, when, when it's at its best depends totally on the climate where you're living. Um, it blooms later in Scandinavia, hence all the midsummer associations, midsummer picking parties, what have you. Um, here in Ireland, it hits its peak or, around early May um, and is completely gone by midsummer. Um, so it, it's going to depend, the exact timing is going to depend on, on your local climate. Um, now, I mentioned that it self seeds extremely readily, um, extremely. Um, the downside is it, it's very difficult to grow from commercial seeds. It needs it needs to seed itself fresh. Um, if you want a lot of angelica, you can either buy a huge amount of, of commercial seeds and, you know, maybe a couple of them will come up, um, unless you have a, a source that, that you can actually get them really fresh from, um, which, which is always a possibility if you know the right place near near you to go. There's a fair number of of um, 
small herbalism businesses who will collect and send seed directly to you. But other than that, you can buy a, a plant or two from a garden center, nurture them for two years, and then have all the Angelica you could imagine wanting. Not to mention Angelica for your friends, or for gorilla growing along the roadway. Um, all of which some people might have, might have done in the past. Um, sometimes it can be a triennial, um, usually it's a biennial. Um, it prefers rich, moist soil. It likes a kind of a half shady place. It's a really good plant to grow if you've got an enclosed garden that doesn't get quite enough light for most herbs to thrive, um, because it's pretty tough in that regard. Um, and in, when, when it's coming into seed, it gets very large, very fast, um, at one point, I had a second year um, Quan that was about three foot high when I went on a five day trip in the spring, and when I got back, it was well over six foot tall. Um, theoretically, it is claimed that you can clip off the flower heads as soon as they form to make the plant a perennial, but it didn't work when I tried it. Um, the roots are actually pretty small for such a big plant, and if you don't have a lot of garden space, it will actually do very well in just a five-gallon pot. It doesn't spread out a lot. It doesn't grow deep. Um, what there is tends to ki kind of clump up solidly. Um, so you can just get a, a good-sized pot and, and have, have your um, quan if you like. Um, when it's fully grown, the stalks are, are hollow, hence the whole episode with the snake being driven down them. They've got quite thick, tough walls. Um, and if you... Take one of these stalks and bind it and wrap it to keep it from cracking and getting brittle um, as it finishes drying and ages. Um, you can then fill it with holy herbs or other other things as appropriate. Um, a small one makes a, a good gonder. Um, a large one you could make a full-size stave out of. Um, you c the roots can also be used for dyeing, um, and we found out... Um, that on a skein of white wool mordanted with alum, it produces a lovely warm gold. Um, theoretically, you can get a blue-gray if you add ferrous sulfate. We haven't tried that one, but the alum worked a treat for a rich gold. Um, and uh, that is um, pretty much all I, I have to say about the Angelica. Yeah, I think that uh, that that was really interesting, and I guess we've been going about an hour, so that's probably uh, a good place to start and pick up again next time with more herbs. I think we have more to go through at this yes. point. Well, I want to thank you for being with us this evening, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing uh, seeing you again soon. And I want to thank all my audience for being here, and we'll see you next time here at Cat's Eye on the Future. You have been listening to Cat's Eye on the Future, the show where we take a look at what's coming up in your world and your future. Join us again next time for another episode of Cat's Eye on the Future.